Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted and honoured to, to be here this morning. I really am, and I'd like to thank uh, Stephen Finicio, the um, Wilmer Hale, and the team in Wilmer Hale for uh, inviting me and for hosting us here, here, here this morning. And I would also like to thank Petra and the uh, Small State Centre and their team uh, uh, to, for, for, for organising this because I believe it's a very, very important, uh, it's a very important agenda. It's a very important dimension of the, uh, of the global <coughs> environmental agenda, the role of small states within it. Um, I was at the last conference, I chaired a uh, session at the last conference and it remained in my memory. Um, it educated me a lot. It opened my mind to a lot of things that I had no, no notion of. Um, uh, I, I have an interest in small states. Um, I come from a small state. It doesn't fit within the definition of small state. Um, the definition of small states is really tiny states. But uh, we are a small state in, 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 in Ireland. Um, uh, Sir David last night asked me what's the population of Ireland. I can tell you this morning that uh, there is 4.75 million in the Republic of Ireland. We make up 0.92% uh, of the population of the, EU, of the EU. So we're a very small state. And, but in the Brexit negotiations, we know we're a small state. But at the same time, and in many, uh, in many issues that come up in the world, we, we know that we're a small state. We've seen the, the advantage of collaboration and, 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 and of liaison and, 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 and of alliances in, in allowing us to be able to be at the centre of the Brexit negotiations. And this is something that, that, that allows us, if you like, to box above our weight very often in, 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 in the world. So I, I've got a great interest in, in small states, and as a citizen of the European Union, I've got a great interest in large states. And, and the citizenship of large states is, is very important, because no matter if you're a child born in a large state or a child born in a small state, it's, 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 it's your heritage that, that, we're, that we're, we're, we're dealing with here. Um, today, uh, the, uh, I, I'm in a different capacity so, somewhat, uh, as I'm the president of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators this time. I won't be next time if I'm invited back. Uh, we have a, a, we're a global organization. We're 100 years old. We have 16,000 members across 40 branches. We're in 133 of your countries. And uh, we're uh, made up of 16,000 uh, professionals from disciplines um, numerous dis disciplines and industry sector. We're engaged in private dispute resolution, uh, including arbitration, mediation, conciliation, adjudication, expert determination. So there's a huge well of knowledge and of expertise within our institute available for you. Um, our training courses include training judiciary and giving advice to governments on the introduction of alternative dispute resolution into 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 countries around the world. Um, now, uh, the, the linking that to, to what we're about today here is we're about damages and we're about costs. And damages and costs are, uh, arise in the context. It's the words, it's the language of, of contention. It's the language of, of adjudication. It's the language of conflict. Um, and everyone knows at this stage that mediation, that negotiation is the ideal way of resolving disputes. And we know that from our own homes. Uh, we, we know it from our own families. And that, that, that mediation is a step to outside for assistance to, 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 help, help, resolve, uh, to, to help resolve disputes. In, 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 in the world of international uh, relations, negotiation, uh, is among the family of nations. And the, that, that's a diplomatic, that's a diplomatic world. But the diplomats don't always succeed. And next month, we celebrate the centenary of the return of peace to, 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 the, to the world. 
uh, 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 after the carnage of the First World War. And that happened as a result of the, of the failure of diplomacy. And the failure of diplomacy followed by no recourse to an adjudicative system to give to apply the rule of international law, resulting in, in carnage. Now, by analogy, we're looking at, uh, at, at uh, difficulties experienced at the moment by, by, uh, by the diplomatic community in trying to negotiate the, uh, a, 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 a method of dealing with the threat to our, 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 our global ecosystem. If that fails through negotiation, and it's looking like it is, because there are some very, very negative uh, moves since our last, our last meeting um, in, 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 in the world, and, and ve very concerning and very self-interested moves, and a move away from collaborative relationships. F collaborative relationships are not on, appear to be on, on the agenda at the moment. So if that negotiation fails, then we have only got the, the, the possibility of some kind of alternative dispute resolution, whether it be through courts or through some form of dispute resolution, whether it be through the international court system or through, through, uh, through, through arbitration, uh, never excluding mediation running in tandem with any adjudicative process. So, uh, so it seems to me that, that if we are, are, are not to, not to, to if, if we're not to, to avoid, or rather if we are to avoid the inevitable carnage that, that it will come with the destruction of our ecosystem, which will be on a scale as great as the First World War, as a scale, as, 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 and the damage to, to people and the damage to the environment, and, and uh, uh, of the Second World War with a nuclear attack on women and children and the environment. Um, if, if we are to avoid uh, that, we do need some dispute resolution system in place, courts, uh, arbitrations are what we have. And in, in that process, it, they, they, they follow on from a failure, but there is hope that that will then provide resolution. It will provide the rule of law rather than other, other, um, other re recourses uh, for that, that states and organizations will, will have. So very uh, quickly, what I, 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 we're looking at damages here and costs. I'll very br quickly talk about a number of recent cases. Uh, the the um, uh, Elizabeth Maremba yesterday spoke about the profusion of treaties, instruments, and other uh, uh, documents providing rights and obligations. Um, if, we, if we look at one case, which is Costa Rica and Nicaragua, uh, uh, that, that was brought under um, the Pact of Bogota and the Statute of the Court. The, um, it, there were alleged violations over Costa Rican uh, territory. It was, it was a decision of, um, have I got the date here, it was earlier, February, 2nd of February 2018. There was an award of damages of 378,890 uh, US dollars for impairment of environmental goods, services, uh, biodiversity, etc., cetera, restora restoration measures, monitoring of damages, cost of flyovers, cost of reports, the future monitoring, flyover, satellite images, costs of reports, construction of protective measures, a dike, it was, it was, um, it was a dispute relating to the, um, the, 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 the Rio San Juan and the Isla Portillos. Um, uh, that, that, that gives an idea of, of how damages would, would be a, a remedy. Again, the four, in another case, the forum being the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, there were arbitral proceedings under Annex 7 of the Convention, with an application for provisional measures. Um, uh, that's th 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 this, this year as well. Um, uh, it was uh, Ghana and the Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, the uh, dispute concerning the delimitation of the maritime boundary between those two countries. 
damages was not requested. Uh, uh, it, was, it was a preliminary application. Uh, Ghana shall take all necessary steps to ensure no new drilling. Uh, Ghana shall take all necessary steps to prevent information resulting from past, ongoing or future exploration activities. Ghana shall uh, carry out strict continuous monitoring. The party shall take all necessary steps to prevent serious harm to the maritime environment. The party shall pursue cooperation and refrain from any unilateral action. So there's an example of where, where an adjudicative process, preliminary measure that it is, had remedies that were not damages. Uh, then we move to, 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 to the area of private dispute resolution, um, which was an ICSID case um, entered into by agreement of the parties being Burlington Resources and the Republic of Ecuador. And this was a decision on a counterclaim uh, in, in, in the dispute relating to infrastructure claims. Um, Ecuador was, was awarded, um, was awarded uh, $39,199 for its environmental counterclaims and uh, $2,577,000 for infrastructural counterclaims. And uh, the, the heads of damage there were the cost of environmental remediation, uh, the cost of infrastructure, and simple interest on, on a LIBOR. And the costs were reserved in that case. Um, the outcome of the proceeding was that, that, um, that the case settled, and a procedural, uh, the, uh, the Secretary General issued a procedural order to that effect. Um, now, in, in Ireland, I, I suppose the, my, my own uh, experience is uh, I represent, represented a, a heritage group in trying to uh, stop a motorway going through, um, go, go, going, go, going through a heritage site. Um, in another case I was involved in, involved uh, taking action against a local authority to stop the reduction of the River Barrow. Um, in general, um, in, in general, the, the, uh, the, the claims in our, in, in would have been in domestic, in domestic uh, fora. And here, in, in an interesting case um, in, in England here was the Court of Appeal. It's a case of um, uh, HRH, the Amir Godwin, Bebe, Okpabi, and others from uh, Nigeria suing uh, Royal Dutch Shell. And it was... Um, it was a case before the, 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 the English Court, Court, Court of Appeal uh, 2018, earlier this year. It was an appeal from the High Court and a challenge to the jurisdiction of the, of the, English, high, uh, of the English courts. And the Court of Appeal agreed with the uh, decision of, of, of the High Court, uh, uh, Mr Justice Fra Fraser, and sent the case, uh, refused jurisdiction over the case. It's related to alleged pollution and environmental damage in Nigeria, and it was taken by the Emir on part of his community. Um, there was repeated large oil spills impacted on the lives and the health and the environment of 50,000 people. And the action was in negligence, not under one of these, uh, these international uh, treaties. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, it, the, the jurisdiction was refused on a failure of the, uh, uh, the applicants to meet a sufficient uh, test to, 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 to show that there was a duty of care on the part of the parent company based here in, in England. So th that gives you a flavour of, of the cases. They're not necessarily small states cases. They are environmental law cases. And we can see that there's a many different fora can, can come in. And then the, there's the cost. So in that last case, the Court of Appeal mentioned the fact that they had lots of money. Both the Emir and Shell had no shortage of money. Um, but I think that with small states, money is an issue. And it's not only legal costs, it is also the costs of the, um, of the, of the evidence. Um, uh, I spoke yesterday with uh, Sir, Sir David and, and, and um, Stephen Finizio, we were talking here, and uh, Stephen was saying that small states don't realise the amount of goodwill that there is and the possibility that there is and the resources in the legal community. I'm not too sure that, 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 that you can ever have uh, scientific evidence on a pro bono basis. It's almost impossible.
in my, in my, in my experience. But then we have the possibility of third party funding coming in, which we don't have a speaker on today, but perhaps we can deal with that in, in questions and, 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 and answers. So that's setting the scene. Um, uh, our first speaker, the order in which we've decided is there seems to be a certain logic in the presentations of the speakers. And uh, we're, we're, we're honored to have Simon Mills, my colleague here. Um, uh, he's of 20 Essex Street in, in, in London here, a barrister, an international lawyer. Um, he's regularly instructed in commercial international arbitration cases. Um, among which is the Republic of Serbia and ImageSat International. And uh, he's a published author, uh, be, be, being uh, the author of the, um, uh, the, the Yearbook of International Environmental Law. So very much an expert in the field that we have to hand here. And he, uh, he, he's, he's eminently qualified to be our uh, first speaker here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jim, for that wonderful uh, contextual opening. Uh, it's, it's fantastic to be involved with you all in this very special and refreshing conference, which feels like a dish that's taken hundreds of very unique ingredients and combined them together and cooked them and let them stew over a very intensive process with uh, Petra uh, as the master chef. So much appreciated. Um, my presentation is all about remedies and, in particular, causation in climate change litigation. So rather than attempt to cover uh, at a shallow depth the whole field of uh, damages and causation in environmental law, I want to focus very much on climate change litigation. The starting point and where I come from is... Uh, the situation wonderfully summarized by Jim just now, that we are facing not only a climate change problem, but a climate change emergency. And the heart of that emergency is what you could call the Paris gap, the difference between the commitments so far made by states to reduce uh, emissions of greenhouse gases and what would actually be necessary in order to meet the objectives stated in the Paris Agreement. So some say the Paris Agreement is our route to a low carbon future that saves the world. Others argue that it is the longest suicide note in history. But what is clear anyway is that st still we are nowhere near on track towards actually meeting even what the Paris Agreement says that we should be meeting. And we cannot litigate our way into achieving that but I nonetheless believe that litigation can play some part because it's about increasing the risks uh, of running a fossil fuel business and thereby decreasing the rewards on offer from uh, fossil fuel businesses promoting cleaner energy. What do I mean by climate change litigation? Well, there are many complex definitions, and here is my working definition. Basically, lawyering in contentious cases that seeks to further the objectives of Paris. Uh, I wouldn't be the first person to suggest that when we talk about climate change litigation, we should break it down a bit and recognize that there are different types of case which have different types of needs and are suitable for different purposes. There's a really good article uh, by a professor at Edinburgh University called Navraj Raleigh, all about uh, breaking down different types of climate change litigation in a much more sophisticated way than I'm doing here. This is my own basic homegrown, simple practitioner's typology. I reckon that it's helpful to split it into these five areas. Um, cases about administrative law, which is pushing the largely pushing the government to comply with its own statutes. Secondly, cases based on if you, what I would call super law. In other words, law which supersedes statutory law, such as constitutional and human rights norms. Thirdly, Cases based on private law against private actors. The Shell case, which Jim mentioned just now, would be an example. Um, enforcing, fourthly, enforcing private law, enforcing regulatory duties against private actors. I'll speak about that in a bit more detail. And finally, defending anti-regulatory or anti-environmental lawsuits. So just to give uh, quick examples of each type, 
administrative law and enforcing statutes, one of the most famous and successful cases is Massachusetts v. EPA in the United States. The US federal government was refusing to regulate uh, emissions of carbon dioxide from motor vehicles. On the ground, it said that the Clean Air Act simply did not cover carbon dioxide. It only covered local pollutants from industrial emissions. Massachusetts, a number of other states and cities and NGOs brought a case which went to the Supreme Court that decided that, in fact, the Clean Air Act should be interpreted so that carbon dioxide fits within the capacious definition of air pollutant under the Clean Air Act, thereby triggering a whole raft of duties on the Environmental Protection Agency to regulate both mobile sources, cars, and stationary sources, power stations. Uh, super law, we have a very interesting example before the US courts now in the District of Oregon in the Juliana case, where a group of young uh, teenage plaintiffs are alleging that they have a constitutional right to an atmosphere capable of sustaining civilized life and that the federal government has violated that right over many decades by tolerating and even promoting uh, fossil fuel industries on a vast scale in the US. So it's an extremely daring lawsuit. We have another example in Colombia where recently the Constitutional Court recognized the Amazon as having legal personality. And they did that because, again, based on fundamental rights and the threat to the survival of human beings. Um, private law remedies, I'm going to spend most of my time actually talking about that. And, and we have this interesting example of the Juarez case, Mr. Saul Luciano Luia against Europe's largest power company, RWE. Uh, my colleague, Monica Freer Tinter, mentioned that case yesterday. I'll go into more detail in a second. Uh, I will also go into more detail on this uh, case of uh, Conservation Law Foundation versus Exxon, which is all about in enforcing, uh, compelling uh, private entities to adapt to climate change in order to protect everyone else. And we shouldn't neglect, I'm sorry you can't actually see it now because it's under the table, but the fifth option is uh, defending anti-regulatory lawsuits. I mentioned the Massachusetts case, which triggered the US federal government to start regulating carbon emissions, including from the power plant sector. And of course, that brought on a raft of litigation challenges uh, from the fossil fuel industry. And West Virginia versus EPA was one of the most important of these. It's now, sadly, of only historical interest because the uh, Trump administration withdrew the regulation before the court the DC Circuit had actually had a chance to issue its judgment, so we may never know what they will say, but it was certainly a massive and very important legal battle. Now, what I want to focus on here, and my thesis of this talk, is that the, the central problem of climate change litigation is your theory of causation. If courts can develop theories of causation which are workable for the plaintiffs in these cases, then there is a hope that climate change litigation can make a difference and change the balance of risk and reward in the fossil fuel industry. If they can't, then it looks likely that climate change litigation will achieve little. Legally speaking, causation is very difficult for the same reasons that climate change itself is a wicked problem that's very hard to solve through policy. Our laws are usually designed to provide redress for a specific identifiable harm, which a specific bad guy did to a identifiable plaintiff uh, in some way that is contained and, and, and within bounds. Even the biggest class action lawsuits on things like defective drugs or mis mis-selling of investment products or whatever, they nonetheless have a very a defined subject matter. Climate change is something that's been caused over hundreds of years by billions of people to varying extents. And therefore, trying to make that legally actionable is a, a whole different level of, of challenge. Let's take as an example of this, then, the Huaraz case in Peru. So there is the, uh, the claimant, Mr. Luciano Duilla, standing somewhere near um, the lake, which you can see. So he lives in the town that's just visible in the picture. And right above it is this glacial melt lake called Palcachoga. Um, it's existed for a long time, but it's getting bigger because the glaciers above it are melting. 
and there is a serious danger that the existing protections against a glacial lake outburst flood will be inadequate. If and when that happens, a vast amount of water, some ice, lots of boulders and mud will fall onto the town, and it will happen much more quickly than the people will be able to leave. So there is a, a risk of a genuinely lethal incident there. Now, Mr. Luciano Druilla, as you, may, as you may know, is suing RWE, a large German power company, based on a systematic and scientific study which says that RWE is responsible for about 0.5% of all the CO2 emissions since 1750 in the world. So on that basis, he asks the German courts to order RWE to pay for 0.5% of the costs of draining this lake and putting in better flood protection so as to remove the danger. And you can see why this, even though the claim is only for 17,000 euros in this instance, you can see why it's potentially a landmark decision. Because if he can get his 17,000 euros, then what about everybody else in the world who may be able to hold RWE responsible for 0.5% of their adaptation costs to avoid serious emergencies? And then they can look at, of course, holding others responsible as well. RWE is represented by Freshfields, who naturally have put forward some quite formidable arguments against the case. They challenge causation. They say, well, some evidence suggests actually it's getting cooler up there in the Andean Mountains. It's not even getting warmer. Just because global temperature temperatures are rising doesn't mean local temperatures are rising. Some of their arguments have a sort of denialist flavor. You might ask, how come, how come all the glaciers are melting if it's actually getting cooler? But anyway, but then they have more so sophisticated arguments. And this ties into uh, Pene Huro's presentation from yesterday about how much natural variability there is in the background. Not all the temperature changes are due to climate change. And sometimes you get less snow in the mountains, and sometimes you get more. And that's not directly correlated to climate change. Now, when you've got less snow, there's less white stuff to reflect all the sun's heat. The black rocks absorb more heat, and that causes melting. So some of the melting may be due to other, other matters. And what about the fact that you know, the government might have neglected the flood barriers for a while? And what about the fact that the government's been allowing people to actually live in the shadow of this glacial lake? Isn't that also, to an extent, a cause of the problems? Um, Freshfields also point to the fact that uh, there's a lot of black carbon pollution in the area. That's something Monica uh, talked on yet yesterday. Soot and so on. Where's that coming from? It's not coming from RWE in Germany. That's too far away to make a difference. It's coming from local people burning stuff, burning wood or it's coming from trucking on the highways through the Andean mountains. So all that soot, which helps to uh, absorb more heat and cause melting, that's also making a difference. In other words, causation is a giant sort of mess of interacting causes, and therefore it's not necessarily straightforward to hold one power company in Europe responsible. And perhaps the most powerful objection is this. Even if we accept that 0.5% of all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was produced by RWE, burning stuff. And we accept that the melting of the glacier is caused by global warming. So we accept the claimant's case completely. Nonetheless, what would have happened if RWE had never burned anything? The answer is, and, and what would have happened even if RWE's customers had never asked RWE to burn anything and they'd simply gone without energy over the entire history of RWE? Nonetheless, we'd still have 99.5% of the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that we do now. And we'll have 100% of that pretty soon because other people are still contributing them. So where is the causation? They say, how can you show that but for uh, RWE's behavior, Mr. Luciano Druilla wouldn't have the same problem that he does. So with that very serious objection, it's perhaps worth asking what would happen in the English courts if one tried to sue on that basis? Where would you get to? Well, probably something like this. And that's where they got to uh, in Germany uh, in the first instance court. The Essen District Court basically said, 
the fundamental problem with this case is you cannot show but for causation. They said the key principle is but for, conditio sine qua non. Look, look at the very last sentence, if you can see it. Past and future greenhouse gas emissions by the defendant would need to be hypothetically undone, and then that solves the problem in order for this to be actionable. So that's the theory of causation of the court in Essen, and for that reason, the claim was rejected. But matters didn't stop there, because in the appeal court, sorry, Ooh. they adopted a different analysis. They said under this section of the German Civil Code, actually a contribution to the problem is sufficient. And they cited this commentary, which was on an analogous provision, but they said the same logic applies. Basically, if you've got multiple people contributing to a problem, then as soon as those contributions become significant cumulatively, you can get relief against all of them up to the point that you remove the significance of the problem. So they've moved away from but-for causation into a different theory, which is basically saying that a material contribution to the problem is enough to allow legal relief. And that, as I see it, is the crucial move uh, in order to make uh, climate change litigation uh, viable. So, and that theme of this move from but-for causation to a material contribution test is one that's going to recur uh, when we look at uh, how climate change litigation has fared in, uh, in other uh, fora. Turning first then to the, the first type, administrative law, in the UK it's not so much of a problem because we have a broad standing test, but in the United States, Basically, causation is a problem not only in being able to win the case, but even be having the right to uh, bring the case in the first place. Under US doctrines of constitutional standing, one of the three requirements for constitutional standing is that you can show causation between what you're complaining about, the, the Defendant's Act, and the harm you say you suffer. Um, this was only discovered uh, in a 1992 case, Lujan, 203 years after the US Constitution came into force. But nonetheless, it's treated as being a constitutional bar to, uh, to showing standing. Uh, the decision of the majority was criticized in that case as being, uh, criticized by a dissenting judge in the same case, as being uh, a slash and burn expedition through the law of environmental standing. And sadly, uh, for environmentalists anyway, it, it, it has stuck. Uh, it means that it's relatively easy if you, for example, suffered a chemical plant explosion on your doorstep, then standing is not a problem. But if you're trying to sue the government to do somewhat better about one aspect of a big and complicated problem, it sets up a very a, a difficult standing challenge. That became evident in uh, Massachusetts v. EPA, where the plaintiffs were trying to push the federal government to regulate car emissions. And it was clear that car emissions do not cause the whole of global warming. They are roughly 4% of all global CO2 emissions. And for that reason, if you're only dealing with 4%, can you really show causation between uh, the harm complained of? And can you really show that your case is going to actually solve the problem you're complaining of? Uh, that for the minority, the conservative minority in Massachusetts meant that there was no standing to bring the claim at all. But five justices disagreed with that view, and I think you can see a kind of harmony between the majority in Massachusetts and this idea of a material contribution. They say, well, yes, there are lots of big and complex problems in the world, and agencies like legislatures do not generally resolve massive problems in one fell regulatory swoop they whittle away at them over time. And therefore, as long as something, as long as a, a regulatory action has a, a chance of making a difference, makes a material contribution to solving the problem, then it is legally reviewable and there will be standing. Uh, Jim, yeah, <laughs> I'm conscious I need to, uh, I need to wrap up. So, um, well, why don't I then, um, 
you know, I, it, I think you'll probably have time to right. go into some of the other um, uh, cases in the question and answer. Because uh, very I'm, good, I'm just very conscious good. that if we if we have yeah. the three speakers, mm. then there will be questions and answers, and you you can you can do that, that then Certainly. within within. Well, well, thank you very much for your attention, and thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. <coughs> thank you so much. Um, our our, ne our next speaker is Scott MacDonald, who is a and he's a principal in Rambles Environment and Health Group. Um, he was 30 years experience as a consultant, as an advisor, as an expert witness uh, in uh, dispute resolution procedures and in, uh, in, in organisations uh, seeking to, um, to perform uh, their... associated with primary restoration and compensatory damages in natural resources. So <coughs> thank, thank you very much. Um, good morning. Uh, like everyone, I'm very, uh, very happy to be here and appreciative of, of uh, Steve, Finicio, and Petra asking me to be involved in this conference. Um, what I do is, um, is maybe a little different than what most folks in this room do, but it, it fits nicely uh, under appropriate circumstances. Uh, as James said, my, my primary work now is serving as an expert witness capacity in arbitration cases, including one or two mentioned already in this conference and, and other factors. So um, what I, oh, let's see. Still trying to load. I'll talk for a minute. So what I wanted to do for a minute is, in recognizing the enormity of the, of the issues associated with small states, right? There are some big, important, and difficult challenges. But in the interim, we we push on, right? We push on with litigations. We push on with arbitration cases. And so what I wanted to do today, I think they're trying to load it up, um, but I'll, I'll I'll talk and then catch up. Um, is I wanted to talk about uh, what I do in the context of ex expert witness work and how I work with attorneys and, in some cases, with tribunals in, uh, in dealing with these problems. So uh, no doubt there's been a, a growing trend from our perspective in international dispute matters. They tend to be related to res resource development uh, projects and in infrastructure projects uh, the parties involved tend to be private parties, multinational corporations, uh, sovereign governments, uh, NGOs, project developers, and financing folks, right, that want to invest money in these projects. And they tend to be uh, commercial disputes, investor state disputes, uh, cross-border pollution disputes, uh, and these are the kinds of matters that, within my organization, uh, Rambo, um, not to be confused with Rambo, you know, right from the, 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 from the movies, if you've seen them, um, uh, that we tend to be involved, uh, involved with. By the way, prior to three years ago, uh, I was part of an organization called Environ. Um, and within the legal community, they probably still remember Environ more so than Rambo. Rambo is a Danish consultancy that we merged with three years ago. They're, they're headquartered in Copenhagen, just if you're interested. So, okay, here we go. Well, now I have to get the thing working. Okay. Um, so, uh, no doubt, and the kinds of technical assistance or expert assistance that we're often asked to do relates to assessing the nature and magnitude of human health and ecological environmental damage, right? And these damages often will come in the context of, well, they can come uh, in the context of, uh, um, of counterclaims uh, brought by various states. I'm currently involved in one in, in related to the Ecuador-Parenco matter. 
uh, and addressing that. Our job is oftentimes to, uh, I, to forensically identify sources and fate and transports of con to contaminants, trying to figure out sort of who did it and where and what's the likely impact uh, of that. The kinds of skill sets required is varied. Uh, geologists, hydrogeologists, that's my academic training, by the way, but after three decades of work, you've, you've learned a lot of things. Uh, engineering, air quality, faint and transport folks, uh, risk assessors in human health and ecological sciences, and environmental and social impact assessments. So it, it, these cases often require um, very multidisciplinary people. Um, the challenge is, and, and maybe Steve or others talked about these yesterday, uh, often relate to, uh, from a technical perspective, the incompleteness of environmental data sets. Um, you don't walk into these matters and somebody's already done all this work and it's perfect and you can you know, rely on it without having to do other work. Um, Uncertainties of, of issues, sources and magnitude. Many of these cases are decided with, uh, with this still being somewhat uncertain. Use of broad assumptions, modeling interpolations, um, trying to use tools that can help you. Um, selection and application of standards. In many jurisdictions, they may not have fully developed environmental standards or ecological standards or human health benchmark standards uh, from which you can just plop, look at data and compare them against them. Uh, this is oftentimes a very big issue. Um, and then it becomes, from my perspective, I'm asked, well, what would be international best practices? And of course, yeah, everybody has their own opinion about that, right? Um, uh, the, uh, sorry, Getting a bit of a glare of stuff here. Uh, burden of proof questions, degree of convincing proof. Steve talked about that yesterday as well, where um, it's not always clear. Uh, parties have, uh, uh, have various burdens of proof. Uh, they can be high standards to meet because you can be dealing with you know, oil field concessions in Peru and Ecuador and other places and where you had multiple operators over decades. And then it becomes, well, who did what? And oftentimes the honest answer is, it's near impossible to tell, right? And you can do fingerprinting and all, all this other stuff with petroleum hydrocarbons, but it's very difficult to prove cases on that basis alone. So there's a lot of, uh, again, forensic work that you try to do to understand source and time frame and this, that, and the other thing. Um, other important considerations um, relate to industry practices, um, application of more recent approaches and analytical methods, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute uh, uh, using several examples. So despite all of these uncertainties, there are a variety of tools that we have to use to look at sites and cases, right? Whether it's U.S. litigation or uh, arbitration-related work in South America or in Europe or other places, right? So, um, and I thought it would be useful this morning to talk about, in the context of tools, the approaches. There's not just one approach, right? Uh, it'd be quite boring if there was one approach, um, but there never is. So. I thought I'd present three, three approaches that I've personally taken and others in our firm have taken. And, and so how do we look at, again, the context of assessing environmental damages um, uh, in these kinds of cases? Um, and so the three are sort of forward-looking assessments using human health and environmental risk assessment. Um, Many of you in this room may be familiar with that. Um, other developing tools where we've used more of an ecosystem valuation method, which uh, I would say 
it's, it's not emerging, it's been floating around for a bit, but provides for perhaps I would call more holistic thinking about uh, cases where there's been environmental, uh, human health, or ecological impacts, right? And site investigation work, more of a retrospective assessment uh, based upon data that may already exist in a given matter. You have something already to look at and to think about. So these things may not be uniquely applicable to small states, but they have equal application there. And the issues encountered are often the same, right? And so they might not be, in many of the cases I've worked on, uh, I worked on a matter uh, in Panama. It's not a large state. Right? It's not a tiny state, but it was a matter against Pan Panama, against Texaco. Uh, I was representing Panama in that particular matter, and it was essentially a tariff matter. Right? Pan the Texaco wasn't producing or refining enough oil in country, so they were importing refined petroleum products, and they were subject to t a, you know, tariff tax on that. And so that started, and then along the way, um, Panama decided to say, oh, and by the way, you've crapped up the environment. Now, they had. I mean, this is not, no secret. It's all, I mean, it's all, they, they, they had indeed. But then they started to focus on that. And it, that matter, uh, it was, I think, effective at helping to facilitate the parties resolving their differences because the, the numbers that were bantered about and that we developed were fairly significant. So it got their attention. Um, so, these methods can produce different results based on assumptions and in input, and some, sometimes very substantial differences. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute uh, to cite an example. So let's go quickly to health and environmental risk assessment. So, well, perhaps, there we go. So. Um, so quantitative risk assessment is a, is a tool that's used broadly by uh, science folks globally and appropriate for assessing risks to human health in, in the environment uh, for current conditions or even planned future activities. The method typically, and the example I'll show you in a second, estimates um, the case of, of air-related pollutants, an estimation of chemical constituents, use of modeling to assess chemical fate and transport, and to predict concentrations of pollutants in media, air, water, soil, uh, sediments, right? Um, and that these predicted concentrations are then used to compare against benchmark standards for individual pollutants. Now. Um, these are very commonly and well-established methods, uh, and differences in these methods can derive from the accuracy of emissions. Oh, that's all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, they can uh, derive from the accuracy of emissions estimates, inputs to models, and assumptions regarding exposure duration, right? H human health risk assessment, it's about what are the pollutants in the environment and who's exposed to them, right, at what concentration and for what period of time. And the science around that's pretty good. It's not perfect at this point, but highly dependent on um, assumptions and input parameters. So an example of this and that sort of forward-looking concept is a matter we've been working on in Peru. Peru seems to be a popular spot. Uh, just not with Simon and others, where we were um, looking at a, at a uh, smelter um, up in the Andes, about 13,000 feet, uh, maybe one of the dust emission sources floating about near the lake. Um, but, uh, and it was a, it was a company operating uh, the smelter, it, it had general support by the Ministry of the Environment, but there was expansion planned. They wanted to do it, but they had concerns about expanding uh, that expansion, uh, creating, uh, you know, greater potential for harm. And so 
uh, in advance of considering very expensive air pollution control technology, we had a look at what those emission estimates might be under an expansion scenario, right? And so, um, and that uh, basically the claimant in this matter was uh, trying to show that improved emissions control systems would not result in unacceptable health or environmental damage to the local community. So um, that's, the, that's the broad story. Real quick, uh, just some of the specific um, uh, details is that uh, we used in this matter, uh, we used uh, probabilistic lead models um, that, again, are well known, particularly looking at potential exposures to children. Right, it's usually children, the, el the elderly or pregnant women. They're the three most sensitive populations. And so we were using uh, well-known, widely accepted um, model to, to look at this. The second part, and I know my time is drawing near, but let me zip through a couple slides, um, is that this ecosystem service evaluation method. And this method is, I would say, somewhat newer in the world of litigation and arbitration cases. And that consideration is, is given to looking at what are those goods and services provided by the natural environment that directly or indirectly affect well-being, human well-being, and it's food and water and flood protection and recreation. And that the costs and benefits of the natural environment can be accounted by linking these things to economics, right? Just like we can link environmental impacts that we detect or determine to be in place to economics, so can these goods and services of the natural environment. And, and that the, um, uh, and the kinds of things, it's not just ecological things, it's, which in this case, it's listing is uh, breeding areas and nesting areas for birds. There's direct human consumption, water, uh, fishing, bird watching, and passive uses, aesthetic values, and preservation of diversity. So historically, people would look at ecological impacts and try to assess maybe one thing, biodiversity, or impact a certain flora and fauna. This is designed to look at the spectrum of services that the environment provides and balance that against the actual impacts that have occurred. And at the end of the day, the idea is to, is to have an outcome of addressing an impact, but taking advantage of those goods and services from the natural environment. Um, I, will, I will go on to the, the next one, just if I may. Yep. Uh, just one last thought. Uh, and I can certainly happy to discuss, uh, if anyone's interested, sort of a coastal resilience study we did in California, which was which was a, a climate uh, change sea level rise modeling exercise, but we'll pass on that for now. And the last bit involves uh, maybe more uh, retrospective kinds of assignments that experts are facing, and that is looking at um, sites that have known or potentially impacted areas, uh, what are those pollutants of concerns, uh, collection of samples, um, oftentimes constrained by remoteness of areas and, uh, uh, and usually requires a good deal of extrapolation of, of partial data from subsets uh, of impacted areas. So those are, oh, one last, if I may. Those are um, uh, the three methods, I would say, as experts were often utilizing. Again, sort of forward-looking, ecosystem valuation, and then more traditional site investigation, pollutants, who did it, and what are the costs to remedy it? Thank yeah. you okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, that was very interesting because uh, the, uh, the cost of such investigations uh, goes to the cost of the dispute resolution process. And whether it's dealt with as, um, as special damage, uh, 
whether it's dealt with as part of the cost of the proceedings um, is, is, is a matter for of the circumstances and the purpose for which um, the investigations were carried out. And uh, the, um, so from, from that point of view, uh, it's, it comes into the issue of damages as well as damage. And the costs of, uh, or the technical costs of dispute resolution uh, processes in uh, the environmental uh, world is probably the most significant cost in, 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 in my estimation to get your case up and running and, uh, and defended. We'll move on then to uh, 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 my colleague James Neal, uh, who is a, call, is a member of the Bar of England and Wales, uh, called in 20, 2006. Um, he's a member of Landmark Chambers, uh, which is a leading environmental law set. He specializes in domestic and international public law, with particular focus on environmental disputes. Uh, he's acted for the UK Environment Agency in a number of regulatory disputes and advises frequently on the impact of EU environmental legislation on planning and infrastructure uh, projects. Um, he, he, he worked with Allen and Overley's international arbitration team between 2011 and 2017. Thank you, uh, James, for that um, introduction. Um, I'm going to speak to you um, for the next 10 or 15 minutes regarding um, costs and access to environmental justice. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk to you about um, the Aarhus Convention. Um, this may seem as a, a fairly esoteric and, and niche subject because it really concerns access to environmental justice rather than um, substantive rights. But for the reasons I'm going to go into, the, the convention is an important um, international legal instrument that has reasonably and surprisingly sharp teeth in ensuring that states provide access to env environmental justice, uh, including um, access to, uh, providing access to environmental information. I'm going to briefly um, touch upon what I think is a reasonably remarkable way in which the convention has allowed the influence of others, so non-state actors, including the compliance committee established under the convention, uh, environmental NGOs, individual members of the public, uh, perhaps most importantly, to have a significant impact on the way in which domestic environmental law in whichever jurisdiction uh, should be shaped. Um, the, the, the important thing for small states to be aware of, and why it's important, I think, to discuss the Aarhus Con Convention today, is because by being a signatory to the convention, um, that allows members um, to have a voice at the table of the, in the convention and to exert pressures on other signatories for non-compliance with its principles. I mean, it also provides an express uh, dispute mechanism for state-to-state -state disputes uh, for non-compliance of the convention to be brought. So it's a very uh, real tool and a very useful tool um, for those that um, are familiar with it. So what I'm going to do is just briefly explain what the main features of the convention are, um, have a look at the, some of its main institutions and the compliance mechanisms established un under it, and then have a look in a bit more detail um, at what impact uh, it's, from a, specifically from a cost perspective, um, the convention has um, on those member states' um, cost ar architecture and cost rules, uh, on those member states who are signatory to it. So if this button works... Yes, there we go. So um, just briefly, the, the key facts about the convention. Well, it, its full title is there, Convention on Access to Information, Public Participation in Decision-Making, and Access to Justice in Environmental Matters. Um, it's overseen by the UN Economic Commission for Europe, and that's one of the five regional commissions of the UN. Um, but importantly, for reasons I'll go, go into, um, it's entirely open to any other uh, member state to join. So it's not confined to European uh, countries, which is a, a common um, misunderstanding. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's authentic texts are in English, Russian, and French. 
and it was adopted in 1998 in, in the Danish city, which I'm reliably informed is pronounced Erhus. Um, entered into force on, uh, in 2001. The EU acceded to it in its own right in 2005, and the UK uh, shortly after. And I think to date, 46 parties uh, currently are signatories to it. Um, again, all the European or um, former CIS, or, or CIS states, so not, none outside uh, the Europe or, or the, um, the, the CIS region at present. And that's perhaps surprising for reasons I'll go on to explain. So what does the convention, what rights does the convention actually confer? The, um, the, the convention is built upon what's commonly described as three pillars, and it requires parties to confer the following rights on members of the public, and that's important to stress on members of the public with regard to the, the environment. And the first pillar is the right to receive environmental, uh, environmental information held by public authorities. The second pillar is the right to participate in environmental decision making. And the third pillar, which I'm going to um, focus on today, is the right to review procedures to challenge certain public decisions that have been made in relation to the environment. And that's under Article 9. I, I, I mentioned earlier the, the right of non-UNECE um, members to join. And um, I won't go into it in too detail, but there's the express provision um, set out in Decision 11.9 of the meetings of the party to the convention, uh, the, the, which provides a standing invitation to other members to join. Significantly, for any state considering joining, there's no, um, there's no process on application, uh, no audit on application to check that your uh, environmental standards of a particular state are up to scratch or anything like that. It's, a, it's an open... Uh, open invitation to join without any um, particular application process. The, the, uh, the conventions or, or the, 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 the institutions uh, under the convention are um, essentially threefold. Um, once every two years, there must be a meeting of the parties. The, significantly, there is a compliance committee, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail later on, and then there's the convention uh, secretariat. Now, the, the meeting of the parties is the um, perhaps primary institution. Um, that allows, amongst other things, for the, for, to, for, uh, makes provision for the review of policies um, and uh, legal methodological approaches to access to information, uh, public participation, access to justice. Um, it, and it does other things such as prepare protocols to the convention and considers how to, uh, how to amend it. Um, there is a dispute mecha mechanism set out in Article 16 if any, um, if any dispute arises regarding the interpretation of the convention. The um, significantly NGOs can participate in this, uh, the meeting of the parties, and that's set out in Article 10. Um, and that's a feature of the, the, the convention. It, it sort of tries to set a gold standard, even in its own procedures, and allowing uh, public participation. The, the committee um, is important from a, um, a, for, from a cost perspective and ac an access to justice perspective. Um, this is because um, the arrangements and the jurisdiction of the uh, committee can encompass considering communications from members of the public regarding um, lack of compliance with the convention. And um, I'll be correct if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, the Compliance Committee is the only international body other than the European Court of Human Rights that can hear complaints of states' non-compliance directly from the public. And that, that's, that's important for, um, for a number of reasons. The... <coughs> The, the jurisdiction of the committee um, is effect effectively fourfold. It can consider submissions by parties about non-compliance of another party of the convention. There have been two to date. It can consider um, submissions by a party that, uh, that um, despite its best endeavours, it can't comply with the convention. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, no particular uh, party to the convention has fallen on its own sword and, and uh, made such a submission. 
The Secretariat can refer matters about the non-compliance of a party with a convention, and as I said before, it can consider communications from members of the public, including non NGAs about non-compliance. Once the um, committee has ruled on whether there is non-compliance or not following a communication to it, it can set out another number of recommendations. Now, these are quite significant, and I, I speak from a, a UK perspective, but it, the, the comments um, at the bottom of this slide from um, uh, Lord Carnworth may also apply um, in, in terms of uh, any other common law jurisdiction. So the findings of the uh, committee are not legally binding in domestic law, certainly not in, in common law or UK, such as the UK, but they can have persuasive effect in, in, at common law and in particular in EU jurisdictions. And, um, and I've, put out the, I've set out the comment that I mentioned by uh, Lord Carnworth, where he, he, he said that the decisions of the committee deserve respect on issues relating to standards of public uh, participation. So just looking um, in more detail now um, at that third pillar, the, the pillar of access to justice and costs. So Article 9 um, sets out the, um, the, the purpose of the access to, to justice pillar, which is to provide procedures and remedies to members of the public so that they can have the rights enshrined in the Convention on access to environmental information and, and environmental decision-making as well as national laws relating to the environment enforced by law. Now, most importantly, Article 9.4 requires that there must be adequate and effective remedies, um, including injunctive relief uh, as appropriate, um, which must be fair, equitable, timely, and not prohibitively expensive. And that uh, requirement, the proceeding should not be prohibitively expensive, expensive applies to a range of different decision-making uh, set out there in that final bullet point, which I, I won't go on to, but broadly they concern decisions concerning or public decisions that might have an effect on the environment, but also um, decisions by either private persons or, or public authorities which convene national law relating to the environment. So it would include, for example, uh, actions in nuisance or negligence brought by an individual against another person, private law action. Now, um, there have been um, significant changes, and I use the, what's happened in England well as a, as a, as a case study, but um, solely for that reason. But there have been um, three instances of compliance with costs uh, raised in 2008 um, before the committee, which has brought about significant change to the way the cost rules in the UK, uh, in, in England and Wales, um, are set out by in, in, the court, in the court rules. Essentially, um, in 2008, Client Earth brought a, brought a communication to the committee alleging uh, non-compliance by the UK with the prohibitively expensive uh, prohibition in Article 9.4 um, by failing to ensure that judicial review costs were not prohibitively expensive. Now, that led to changes, um, that communication, and which was accepted and upheld by the, the committee, um, led to amendments in 2013 to the English Civil Procedure Rules. And effectively, what had previously been a discretionary um, ability of the courts to award protective cost orders to protect claimants in environmental judicial review um, was turned into an automatic protection. So um, in 2013, the court said, if you're a claimant in an environmental domestic challenge in the UK, um, the cost cap would be um, automatically set at £5,000 with a reciprocal cap of £35,000 for environmental um, challenges. Now, um, there were various other um, Com uh, complaints brought about um, the, UK, um, the, the UK's procedural rules. In 2017, the rules changed again because the government was faced with um, a spike in domestic environmental challenges. And the, the government sought to reintroduce the discretion to vary a cost cap based on the financial means of the claimant. And um, Client Earth has, has sought a judicial review against that tweaked the rules 
um, and that, that was partially upheld by the, the English High Court. And I think there's further communications um, being submitted to the Compliance Committee um, in relation to that, that tweak to the rules. So um, that, that is one example of how the Convention can exert pressure on, or can be used to exert pressure on um, individual states to adapt their cost rules to make it easier for an environmental um, challenge to be brought. There are, um, as I mentioned earlier, that there is the possibility of state-to-state -state disputes for non-compliance being brought. Um, there are two instances there um, set up on the slide. Uh, one was uh, brought by Romania against Ukraine um, in relation to um, environmental Im information in relation to a canal project in the Danube Delta. And there's currently an active um, complaint brought by Lithuania against Belarus um, regarding lack of access to uh, information about a nuclear plant in Belarus. Just to... Just, um, so just to, to wrap up after that extremely quick canter through the convention, um, the, the key feature about, or one of the key features about environmental litigation, um, and particularly domestic environmental litigation, is it's a David and Goliath battle. You heard from um, the, the, you heard some of the examples that Simon um, went through, that you're dealing with an individual claimant normally up against a large comp uh, corporation. That's a paradigm example of an environmental challenge. One of the chilling effects, and a significant chilling effect, on those, um, on those challenges being brought are the traditional cost rules in any um, domestic jurisdiction, which tend to be um, costs follow the event. So knowledge of and awareness of what rights the Aarhus Convention can, um, can afford you as an individual is very important. It seems to me that the, the convention is a pretty powerful tool, firstly, in ensuring states provide adequate environmental uh, information regarding projects, and particular in including where they might have transboundary effects, because there's nothing to stop a member of a, as in the, the Lithuanian case, a member of the Lith a Lithuanian public, for example, complaining about a project going on in a different country. But it, it also is a powerful tool in providing recourse to NGOs and members of the public in circumstances in which costs um, would otherwise be prohibitively expensive. There are significant advantages, it seems to me, in small states um, considering acceding to the convention, not least the possibility of uh, raising uh, or taking advantage of the state-to-state -state dispute mechanisms that are afforded under the convention. But it also gives you a place um, at the meetings of the party in influencing strategy and delivering objectives. The downside, of course, is by acceding to the convention, you'll, of course, be held to the same standards as all the other members in terms of your own uh, costs, rules set out in your own domestic procedures. But um, that may be a small price to pay for the benefits in um, having a seat at the table of the convention. James, I hope I... Uh, have finished you. reasonably promptly and look forward to uh, any questions about this now, I think. Yeah.